they sit at the very pinnacle of British society, the first family. But with no political power, how we see them and what we think about them is critical to the whole institution they represent. The royal family relies upon publicity and uh, popularity as its oxygen for survival. I think they've got unbelievable privilege, and that comes at a cost, and the cost is, of course, they're always in this electronic goldfish bowl. Nothing can prepare you for what it's like to work for the royal family. They are the policy, they are the brand, they are flesh and blood. If the media were not interested in the royal family, the monarchy would be in serious trouble. There was a time when the public tug-of-war between palace and press threatened to tear apart the entire institution. Charles knew virtually nothing about media relations. They viewed the press as this unmanageable beast, trying to get into every aspect of their lives. They viewed the media as having hounded their mother to death. Today, the younger generation appears to be riding high, a new monarchy for a new age. But behind the scenes, the royal family's relationship with the media is far from straightforward. These are the first people I've ever covered, ever, who will not speak to me at all. They would rather suck with the devil than talk to you. I don't believe there is any such thing as private life anymore. We want more, more, more. They're not prepared to give, give, give. For all of his easygoing facade, Prince William is obviously a very controlling character. As the Queen gets older, succession beckons and heirs stand in line. So the public interest in the royal family and the institution they represent will intensify. And that means the relationship between the Windsor family and the media, so often strained, really has never been so important. This is the story of a decades-long battle between the first family and the fourth estate, the monarchy and the media. And it's a story defined by what happened in a Paris underpass back in August 1997. We have a flash here uh, saying that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died in a car crash in Paris. They'd been pursued by paparazzi on motorbikes. This was such profoundly shocking and shattering news that I confess I had difficulty just, just telling the newsroom that, no, actually, she's dead. I'd not been asleep all night. I'd been up through all through the night, working, working. I'd not even thought about Diana dying. I got into the hospital and I saw the coffin and I started to cry, upset, you know, because I realised that it was happening. This is she was really dead. They had all the cameras around my neck and the people were saying, oh, you're an assassin, you're a killer, you know. It was obvious to me that this was going to be one of the most serious uh, moments in the history of the modern history of the British press. Diana's death was indeed to prove serious for the press, but in the face of public grief on an unprecedented scale, it was also becoming extremely serious for the royal family. They were ensconced at the time in Balmoral in Scotland, and widely seen to be out of touch with the popular mood. Among the banks of flowers were some damning messages. You were a rose among a family of thorns. I remember briefing one of our private secretaries on the phone, and they're saying, I know you're seeing this on television, but you really have to be here in London to feel the atmosphere. People here are really anti-monarchy. Uh, and I have to say, yeah, I was worried in terms of, well, where is this going to go? We were getting phone calls from members of the public saying, well, where's the Queen in all this? We, we, why haven't we seen her? Why, why isn't she with us mourning our Diana? People wanted to see the Queen. They were angry that she wasn't there. I, I can't remember a time when the Queen has ever been uh, criticised to the degree that she was. Everybody was taken by surprise by the scale of it almost like a, a national spasm. The Lord Chamberlain said to Tony Blair, we're going to need some help on this. For the royal family, still in Balmoral, private tragedy was turning into a public relations crisis of historic proportions. Finally persuaded to return to London, 
the Queen had no option but to turn to the media in her hour of greatest need, making an unscheduled, not to say unprecedented, TV broadcast to the nation. Since last Sunday's dreadful news, we have seen throughout Britain and around the world an overwhelming expression of sadness at Diana's death. I can remember saying the very, very important that she is there speaking not just as the Queen, but as a grandmother. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. Without doubt, that was the turning point. You could feel that happening. You could feel it. And that day, when I walked back from the palace back to number 10, it was Tony Blair was talking to the Queen quite regularly. He was talking to Prince Charles. And we certainly picked up the sense that Prince William felt really angry about the, about the press. And I can remember at one point Tony saying that one day he's going to be the king. We all know the press can be a complete screaming pain in the neck. Um, but he's going to have to have some sort of understanding about that. The prince has said to me, would you talk to William and Harry? Because they're coming down for the funeral and I need you to prepare them. And so I remember saying to them, the reaction that you will see when you go down to London is because this country loves your mum so much. It is overwhelming. They brought with them to Kensington Palace the steel and the strength many others will require in the coming hours. Thank you so much. If Diana's tragic death was a critical moment for the monarchy, it was also becoming critical for the press. As public anger towards the royal family turned to sympathy for the young writer and editor of every publication that has paid for intrusive and exploitative photographs of her, encouraging greedy and ruthless individuals to risk everything in pursuit of Diana's image, has blood on his hands today. I always believed the press would kill her in the end. I did feel some personal responsibility because I knew that I had helped to generate that frenzied climate that existed throughout the late 90s. They killed they Diana. Commercial they journalists. They and commercial they journalists. They killed Diana. We just hounded the girl to death. And you're still here with your cameras, aren't you? Why can't you piss off and leave us alone? As flags flew at half-mast in Whitehall, they're expecting an anti-media backlash with the demand for new privacy laws to curb intrusion. The press was sitting there in the dock in the court of public opinion, accused literally of murdering the princess. The clock was ticking. The press at that point was looking over the precipice into uh, a fully-fledged, deeply repressive privacy law. The newspaper industry was policed through an editor's code of conduct, overseen by the Press Complaints Commission, which was owned and controlled by the press itself. To satisfy public and political pressure for change, they would have to act fast. I think there is a watershed in the mood in the country and the mood in the press. Ten years of a tabloid feeding frenzy, capped by the death of Diana, had put the press firmly into the crosshairs of fierce public and parliamentary scrutiny. Truly, they were drinking in the last chance saloon. An emergency meeting of newspaper editors was called and the rules of press engagement were hastily rewritten. We are going to be thinking differently and we are going to be extremely aware of the situation that we found ourselves in. There will be no longer a market in this country for pictures by the sort of photographers who persistently pursued Princess Diana. They also agreed to extend the definition of private space to include public places where an individual might have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And they gave much greater protection to young people, all the more important with two bereaved princes to worry about. For the media, it certainly changed the way reporting would be done around the royal family. The goalposts had changed, and it's never been the same. It's certainly less free than it was when I started doing the job in the early 90s, where really it was the media that saw the story, wrote the story, ran the agenda, and really were not controlled in any way. 
which was characteristic of what had become commonplace during the decade-long, very public breakdown of Prince Charles's marriage to Princess Diana. It was a complete feast for the tabloid press. It was open season. Every time they came out of the palace, there was a story of some description. They were leaking like sieves and they were singing like canaries to both sides. I do think, actually, that the press lost its moral compass. The so-called War of the Waleses left the traditional royal approach to dealing with the press, never complain, never explain, and stick to public duties for dead. Replaced by full-on background briefing by both sides about matters which, frankly, couldn't really be more private. And in that media game, she beat him hands down. You've got a, a middle-aged, balding man and an incredible, beautiful princess. It's a no-brainer as to who's going to get the media coverage. When I joined his office in 93, he was going through some pretty virulent criticism. Bad father, unloving husband. I think he was pretty hurt. Diana was the people's princess, the nation's queen of hearts, while Charles was the man not fit to be king. Prince Charles's public relations were at rock bottom, really. There have been people shouting at him at the street, I think, you know, over his affair with Camilla. He felt that he wanted to do it in a different way, and he wanted to take things further and be more proactive with his media operations and his communications. And so it was that in 1996, Prince Charles, who already had his own press operation separate from Buckingham Palace, set about fighting back. He hired a brand new sort of royal press advisor, a spin doctor, to whom he handed control of his media operations. Step forward, the then director of the Press Complaints Commission, Mark Boland. Boland, I mean, he was, he was a genius. He was very, very good at what he did. He loved pulling strings, playing with the press. The princes called him Blackadder. Clever, sly, slippery, but a man you could get on with, a man you could ring up, have a lunch with, and actually get some information. I think Mark was very much a background individual. He probably knew as much about the editors of Fleet Street as, as you know, others did about the royal family. And because of these amazing contacts that he had uh, with editors, was able to get their ear. Brilliant manipulator. It was a revolution, because there was this young, openly gay, comprehensive, educated guy coming in and changing all the rules. And Mark Boland certainly had his work cut out. In the wake of Diana's death and all that had gone before, Charles's reputation was in tatters. The stakes could hardly have been higher. Boland would need to establish a new relationship with a sceptical press and to forge, as they say in professional PR circles, a new narrative for his client, Charles' single parent and caring father. And for that, he'd need to enlist the help of the two young, media-shy princes. Two months after Diana's death and Charles' first foreign engagement, a trip to South Africa. It was an opportunity for Mark Boland to show first the press and then the world a different side to his client's personality. Mark Boland, in a conversation with the Prince, had said it might be an idea to just acknowledge the press and, and just say a few, have a chat with them and just acknowledge it there. And he did. He could have just sat at the front in first class and, and done nothing at all, um, which he, he'd done on plenty of other occasions. But on this occasion, he didn't. He came back down. He talked to the press. He made a point of talking to the photographers, the cameramen, the BBC, the dreaded tabloids. That, of course, put all of us in a good mood. It made us feel we were sort of being included for once. It wasn't just them and us. And the whole tour w w carried on like that. The emphasis was very much on a more relaxed, fun-loving Charles, and critically, that new narrative, Charles the Good Father. To wit, the presence of Prince Harry, coincidentally on a half-term break, created PR opportunities galore. It was heaving with people. 
And uh, I remember his, him coming in and they had traditional dancers with, you know, topless, you know, ladies, that sort of thing. And the typical little boy sort of looking, look at, looking, looking at this. And they were laughing and joking away. And it was, it, it was just father and son doing what they do best. And the media back home wasn't slow to get the message. In PR terms, the trip was a huge success. Well, I mean, clearly a lot of planning had gone into it, but the thing that people misunderstand, if you like, about the press is that we want a story. And we don't really mind what it is as long as there's a story. And we know we're being used. We're, we're always being used, especially by, by on royal tours. And this was a good story. So rather than being unnecessarily cynical about it, it gave us an opportunity to, to write about him, to see him as a single parent. And that worked well for him. And the public liked it. It was a recurring theme. A private skiing trip to Canada. Yet another photo opportunity with the well-briefed new narrative still very much to the fore in all the coverage. Diana's death has plunged Prince Charles into the stark modern reality of single parenthood. His sons are his clear priority. Ironically, from the despair and guilt he felt after the princess's death, he's emerged with his image much softened and his popularity higher than it's been for many years. Jenny Bond, BBC News. So far, so good. But Mark Boland's next task for the Prince would be far, far trickier. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. The third person, the other woman, was Camilla Parker Bowles. <laughs> Mark Boland's main role was to make Camilla more presentable, because by then, Charles had made it clear that she was non-negotiable, so she had to be a part of his life in the future. Operation Mrs PB, I think it was called, very direct PR policy, which didn't really take any prisoners. Just ten months after the death of his mother, the Sun reported in a front-page splash that William had met Camilla for the first time at his flat at St James's Palace. It was an important moment for a young man from a family divided by divorce and traumatised by loss, but its real public significance was as a sign that Prince William accepted his father's mistress as a permanent fixture in the family firm. It was a major milestone in Operation Mrs PB. The Sun got its original tip from a Times executive married to a member of Camilla's staff. But how did the paper get the full story of this private meeting in such intimate detail? We knew that the meeting was taking place. We had to wait for it to happen, which we did. And then when it did happen, we got all the details, you know, her drinking the gin and tonic, her having a sneaky fag beforehand because she was nervous and everything else. Um, so all the detail, you know, came, came to us uh, and was, if you like, was absolutely kosher. We, you couldn't have got, apart from Camilla and William telling us, you couldn't have got it from a better source. And Camilla and William didn't tell you? No. So? It's Mark Bolin, you know, I mean, he, 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 he was the one who, to, who told us, uh, you know, the ins and outs, because we had to be very accurate on this. Mark Boland declined to be interviewed, but described Ray's account as utter rubbish. In any event, back at the St James's Palace press office, Sandy Henney knew nothing of William's meeting with Camilla. Well, the first I heard of it was when Charlie Ray rang uh, and said, I understand William has had a meeting with Camilla. Um, big pause as far as I was concerned. Well, you can have to leave that one with me, Charlie, because I need to go and talk to a few people to see how we're going to deal with this. The Sun had a huge royal exclusive and it wasn't going to sit on it. The next call to St James's Palace was from the newspaper's then deputy editor, Rebecca Wade. I said to Rebecca, yes, yeah, the story's right, I'm not going to deny it, um, but I know a young man who's going to be pretty unhappy with the fact that his privacy has been invaded in such a way. 
She was very good because she said, well, if I give you 24 hours, would that help? And I said, it would help enormously. And because then I had to speak to, to William uh, and tell him what had happened. What did he say? He was justifying being understandably really upset because something was really private. Um, and apart from obviously being angry and upset that he, this, this story got out, I think this is, well, how has it happened? There's no doubt that it is a significant landmark, a means that Prince Charles and Mrs Parker Bowles will be able to see even more of one another in the future. It was very interesting that it was delivered to the sun, clearly a, a strategy testing the water. Let's see what sort of reaction it gets from other newspapers. Would papers like mine, for example, the Mail, which are still very pro-Diana, would we, would, would we kick up a fuss about this, saying well, it's all, all wrong, it's too soon? And did you? No. No, because it was it was a good story, and it was clearly that was the direction the story was moving. I mean, we needed to move our readers along with us. I mean, Charles, William, and Harry were the story now. For me, it was a defining moment uh, with William in terms of he's recently lost his mother. He knows the role of the media in, in, his, in his father's life. He knows the role of the media in his mother's life, and it was for him. This is the beginning now of how you are going to have to learn to manage the press and also get people around you who help you make those decisions. Not tell you what to do, but help you make the decisions. He didn't like being used by anybody and he felt, from what I remember, that he was being used by his father's staff. Do you think he was being used? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sure he was. I think it explained a lot about what happened in subsequent years when he decided to break away from his father's people. A major moment in the Charles and Camilla story had been achieved, but at the cost of William's privacy and even potentially his future goodwill. And then there was the continuing risk that the new royal story would be undermined by the old one. Good afternoon. On the first anniversary of the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, her son's Prince William. You can never let go. Diana's immortal soul. She'll be with us forever. She'll be talked about in a thousand years' time. Around this time, a new biography of Prince Charles was published. At its core, a concerted attempt to rewrite the history of his relationship with Diana. The enduring memory that everybody had of Diana was the panorama interview where she had sat looking very forlorn and, and talked about the three of them in the marriage. Was a husband who loves someone else, yes. I just thought, he's never going to defend himself. Was he actually a villain who destroyed this young, beautiful young girl? Or was he a victim of a, a young girl who, or, or, of, of, of a failed marriage, of a, of a mismatch, of... I just wanted to know what the actual truth was. Penny Juna's Charles, Victim or Villain appeared to have been written with privileged access to royal insiders. How close to the source of the action, if you like, to the principles did you get? I got very close. I got very close. So, B Bolland, you did talk to? He helped me with a lot of the book. Um, I'm not saying he was the source for... I mean, he certainly wasn't the source for everything. He was the source for some things. It would have been a wholly dishonest book if Boland had been my only source. Penny Juna's new book contains allegations about the behaviour of Diana, Princess of Wales, during her marriage. The book made huge news and outraged the defenders of Diana's memory. Penny Juna alleges Diana was the first to commit adultery and that she made death threats to Camilla. It was quite nasty. It questioned Diana's sanity and suggested that the reason why the marriage broke up was because she was nuts. It also poured scorn on the suggestion that it was he, Charles, who'd been the first to stray from the marital bed, that Diana had had a string of lovers, including a policeman. I mean, I had death threats. I had people spitting at me in the streets. It, there was a, a fantastic reaction. Uh, somebody tried to kill me in the Albert Hall. But far from the book reflecting badly on Diana, it was Prince Charles who became the subject of much adverse press comment. Mark realised that um, 
they had to sort of do something about the book. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles have issued their first ever joint statement in which they deny any involvement in a new book about the Prince. Penny Juna's book contains allegations... Stung by the public reaction, Charles and Camilla sought to distance themselves from Penny Juna's book, insisting that it hadn't been authorised, solicited or approved by them. If you look at those words closely, it wasn't authorised. Quite right, of course it wasn't. It wasn't solicited. They didn't ask me to write it, and it wasn't approved. That says what it wasn't. It doesn't say what it was. I went to them, I said, I want to write this book, and I got, I got help. It's quite possible that, that Camilla and Charles didn't know what was going on. In fact, I'm almost certain that they didn't know precisely what was going on. And Charles knew virtually nothing about media relations. Um, he tolerated the media. He didn't particularly like the media. Um, so he really allowed himself to be used, if that's the right word, um, by Mark. If taking on Diana's legacy was fraught with PR danger, the real challenge lay in the future. Having concentrated on his children, his public duties and his charitable works, Charles's own personal position with the public appeared to be improving. But was Britain yet ready? to accept his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. This would be one of Mark Boland's biggest moments. The occasion, a private party to celebrate the 50th birthday of Camilla's sister at the Ritz Hotel in London. I got a call that it was gonna happen at the Ritz and I've, I went down there with my ladder and I put the first ladder down. I booked a room overlooking my position, stayed there for two nights. The world would be watching, and nothing could be left to chance. There were rumours buzzing around uh, our little network of uh, royal reporters, and I, I think it was uh, in a conversation to Mark Boland. And I think I sort of said, "I'm going away. I'm going away tonight. You know, is that a good idea?" And they sort of said, "Well, no, probably not." You know. So I immediately said to the news desk, "Get down to the Ritz." When we got down there, there were loads of people there already. I should have known better. <laughs> There was, I think, 300 yards of photographers and camera crews and sat trucks. And I remember uh, getting a call saying, look, she's very nervous. She's, Can you make sure people don't shout out? I said, look, I'll do that, but you've got to pull the car up at the last minute, not have the car there. And they agreed to do that. It was choreographed and it's designed to introduce Camilla to the world. The scene outside the Ritz was complete media overkill. Charles and Camilla had arrived separately, but Boland's big moment would only materialise when they left, together. I was up a stepladder with a pair of binoculars and a microphone doing a sort of live commentary, match of the day type commentary of this couple coming out the Ritz. Well, very hurriedly down the steps. Uh... Uh, looking sort of bewildered. Side by side, uh, holding each other's hands just briefly. They came down, the car held back, they did that, the car came up, they got him, we all got plenty of pictures. Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of photographs have been taken in these few seconds. Prince Charles and his long-standing companion, Camilla Parker Bowles, have now shown themselves in public as a couple. Photographers now rushing to file those photographs so that they will appear in uh, newspapers, not only in this country, but of course, around the world. Another highly significant milestone had been reached in Mark Boland's Operation Mrs. PB. But as Charles and Camilla's relationship lost its scandalous edge, tabloid focus inevitably shifted towards the royals who wanted the media attention least the teenage princess. However, huge interest resulted in very few stories because they were protected by a deal with the press known as the pressure cooker agreement, originally negotiated back in 1995 when William first went to Eton. We expect the press to leave them alone when they're at school, leave them alone to complete their education. From time to time, the vow would be released, pictures would come on stream, and then the press would go away again and continue to respect their privacy. That was the origin of the pressure cooker agreement. And as the ban on William and Harry's stories continued, 
so relations between the palace and sections of the press deteriorated. Not least because the press was continually getting stories and pictures the agreement meant they couldn't use. There were a couple of times where we had some things in. I remember seeing the pictures of William and then they thought, no, no, no way, no, we can't, we can't use that. I think there was a set of photographs taken of Harry or William uh, shooting out of a car whilst on the Sandringham estate. There was a huge row about that. So yeah, there were photographs still being taken and issued to the, the picture desks of Fleet Street and decisions were having to be made and there were obviously fierce negotiations between the palace and the press. Prince Charles is to make a formal complaint about what he... And it wasn't just stories about William. With Harry in the Daily Mirror, skirmishes became almost cat and mouse. With whole front pages devoted to stories the paper hadn't even published. And on one side, at least, it all got pretty personal. Mr Morgan, why can't you simply leave Prince Harry alone? We, we do leave Prince Harry alone. That's my fundamental point about this. Uh, we have left him alone the entire year, but they're now complaining about us, and I can't work it out. The pressure was on Prince Charles's press office to find a solution for fear that the whole agreement might break down. When William turned 18 in summer 2000, an opportunity arose to give the press and broadcasters some of what they craved. With less than a week to go until Prince William is 18, there's already been intense media interest surrounding his birthday celebrations. I came up with the idea that we would get one cameraman, a guy called Eugene Campbell, and a photographer called Ian Jones. I chose those two because, for me, it was important that William would actually get on with these two. And the idea was that they would spend a couple of weeks at Eton with William, access the like of which the media just, just wouldn't normally get. Eugene and Ian would be given unique privileged access to William to collect images and footage which would then be shared with all the newspapers and TV channels. There was a young man who'd had a troubled background where his mother had been uh, killed, um, the press had been involved. He just did not like the media and half of the task was trying to convince him that we're actually not all that bad. To get the ball rolling, I think we did a, a couple of pictures or whatever. Uh, and the next meeting, or the next time we planned to come along, he, he'd then volunteer ideas himself. So oh, I've been thinking about this, I thought this could work. But what had started as a plan to satisfy the media and introduce William to the press blew up into an almighty row. And instead of releasing pressure, threatened to destroy the whole agreement, protecting the privacy of the young princes. The photographs were meant to be shared with all the newspapers, but as Ian Jones was on contract to the Telegraph, they had access to the pictures well ahead of their rivals. So, unlike the rest of Fleet Street, they would have time to produce a commercially attractive, glossy, special edition magazine. We had the Saturday magazine and we had more time to, to do it beautifully, so it looked great. So, you know, that was our little bit of competitive advantage, I suppose. But do you understand why the rest of Fleet Street was furious? Oh, yes. <laughs> but, you know, what would you do in my place? <laughs> I didn't feel we were doing anything, you know, roguish. I was thrilled that we had a competitive advantage. The Telegraph clearly thought that it had special access to these uh, pictures and was going to produce them accordingly. And we were having to say to them, you can't do that because this agreement will break down and the people that will lose out from that are the royal princes. And that led to really quite a rancorous situation. Rival newspaper editors accused St James's Palace of favouritism towards the Telegraph and incompetence in not securing full control over the photographs. There was a general feeling that I'd done some kind of underhand deal. Uh, I hadn't got the deal done properly in writing. So, so um, it, was, it was the way things were always done, but you hadn't physically got it written down, but then you never did? Never did. So I mean, I'm not trying to say I, I you know, I, I did get it wrong. Um, I think what I wasn't prepared for um, was the vitriol that, that went along with this. When you have a, a Fleet Street editor on the phone to you, um, basically saying, well, that's it. You can't now guarantee that William and Harry are going to have the privacy 
um, that you want because you've done something so wrong, actually there's nothing else you can do other than offer your resignation. And that was Piers Morgan? Yes. For me, the most important thing was William and Harry's privacy in the future. So I offered my resignation and it was accepted. Were you expecting it to be accepted? Part of me thought no, because I'd been with the Prince for quite a long time, but I offered it and it was accepted, so you stand by your decisions, don't you? Which was terrible, because she was the architect of this whole plan to help William, and this had come back and blown up on her face. I've supported the Prince of Wales through thick and thin, but I thought it was quite extraordinary that after all the years of loyal service that she had given him and helped with his grieving sons, I thought it was very strange. Sandy Henney lost her job. The deal with the press held out and the princes remained protected, at least for the time being. The system appeared in public, at least, to be working which was something the Press Complaints Commission was very keen to celebrate. Cue their star-studded, if somewhat hubristic, 10th birthday bash in February 2001. Lord Wakeham and I had a eureka moment and said, let's see if Prince William will come along to it. It might be a good opportunity for him to say thank you to the newspapers that let him have privacy at Eton. He is a high-profile complainant and, uh, of course, high-profile co com high complainants do give us additional publicity. But that's a good thing, because we're trying to do a good job in service to the public. For the PCC, the party was a moment to celebrate, which it did by showing off the royals and other celebrity beneficiaries of its new regime. It had, after all, seen off the threat of a post-Diana privacy law. But there was another royal agenda running that night too. It would be the first time that Prince Charles, Prince William and Camilla had been seen in public at the same event together. Ten minutes later, Camilla Parker Bowles. I'm sure we received a call at some point saying, um, could Mrs Parker Bowles, as she was then, come along? And we said, the more the merrier. Prince Charles, Prince William and Camilla Parker Bowles have all attended a party in London tonight, celebrating the 10th anniversary... Mark Boland was engineering a very significant moment when um, William would finally be seen in public with Camilla. The game was to try and get them both in the same shot, which I think was not achieved. It was rather odd that the, the, the meeting was going to take place, a very important meeting of all places at the PCC. It was strange and it was odd, but then um, that's where Mark felt very happy and secure because his partner, Guy Black, was the boss there at the PCC. Mark Boland was in a long-term relationship with the man who followed him as director of the PCC, Guy Black. The couple were at the centre of the powerful network of editors and royal officials which had successfully rebuilt the relationship between the press and the prince. Relations between the palace and the tabloid press had rarely been better. That's certainly how it looked from the outside. Indeed, in 2001, Mark Boland was named the PR industry's professional of the year, commended for orchestrating a sea change in his employer's public profile and even preparing the way for the previously unthinkable, a potential marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles. Inside the firm, however, Boland's methods were starting to cause trouble, as other members of the family found themselves on the wrong end of royal stories that made Charles look good, at least by comparison. Boland's activities were creating collateral damage. There's no question that Mark was prepared to promote the Prince of Wales, and it, if it dished other members of the royal family, so be it. He made it quite clear that he wasn't bothered about the, the, the other royals. He was only concerned with the Prince of Wales and helping Camilla. He didn't make many friends at Buckingham Palace, but frankly, he didn't care. Take, for example, the Wessexes. Sophie and Edward might have been the architects of their own misfortune with their media business interests, but other royal insiders, as they say, were always on hand to make matters worse. Witness the comprehensive drubbing they got when Prince Edward's TV company, Ardent, 
appeared to have broken a media agreement to protect William's privacy whilst a student at St Andrews University. In media terms, William was still as reluctant as ever, jealously guarding his own personal privacy. So much so that according to insiders I've spoken to, he took some persuading to do that St Andrews press call at all, only agreeing at the last minute on condition that the press didn't just leave him alone afterwards, they left town completely. We took our shots of him arriving at university. We then packed up our gear and off we all trotted. Halfway down the motorway, or wherever we were going, um, my phone went. And uh, one of those unbelievable moments when you're a royal correspondent. Um, Jenny, there's a crew still there. I said, what? ITN have stayed? How dare they, you know? They said, no, 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 it's not ITN, no, no. It's Ardent Productions, uh, Prince Edward's outfit. Prince William, newly arrived as a student at St Andrews, is already at the centre of a row about his privacy. The Ardent crew did not pull out on Sunday after the official photo call, and it was William himself who sounded the alarm when he spotted them yesterday. It's a shocking development. We've, we've left William alone, as we promised to, and now we find uh, his uncle Edward prowling around the bushes. And um, I think we share the nation's concern that his privacy is being invaded by members of his own family. But the news that Prince Edward's TV company was stalking his nephew, Prince William, came as a complete surprise to Edward's producer in St Andrews. While we were waiting for the breakfast bill to be settled up in the hotel, my PA at the time went over to get the papers, and uh, it was literally, oh my God. There were cartoons of us or whatever, there were headlines, and it was, I thought, what's happened, you know? Did you have any inkling before this that there was an issue at all? No. We, no, we, no one had phoned you, no, no one had spoken to you? No. The first that we had an inkling, as you say, about this whole thing was from the papers. Watson maintains that he had only stayed on to film some general shots of the town and a pre-arranged and agreed interview with some fellow students, which, he says, is all that happened. There was nothing incriminating or an attempt to film at any forbidden part of St Andrews, only literally, as was uh, stated at the time, chimney pots and seagulls. So anyone who had seen those rushes, it would have been clear to them that at no point was this camera apparently attempting to catch a picture of William. Absolutely, yeah. Did you think at that point someone, this, someone's up to something here? Yeah, totally, yeah, we all did. I mean, it, it, you'd be a fool not to. Two royal insiders who later saw Ardent's footage confirmed to me that there was nothing incriminating to be found. But, never letting the facts stand in the way of a good story, it soon escalated, with reports of what Charles was said to think about his younger brother. Prince Charles is furious. He's phoned his brother three times, demanding an explanation. My recollection is that from uh, within the palace, you know, the palace press officers and people I spoke to there indicated that uh, Charles was extremely unhappy with his uh, younger brother and could not believe that this had happened. The, the language being used at St James's Palace is irritation, disappointment. You've got to ask where did the story come from, why was it spread and um, how effectively it was done overnight without any calls to us. And it was Daily Mirror editor Piers Morgan who, after a telephone call with his good friend Mark Boland, penned the immortal headline, You f***ing idiot. All the papers carried versions of the story briefed by those same Royal Insider stroke Palace sources, amongst them the Daily Mail. Someone obviously told me Charles's personal reaction. I had a reasonably good line of communication into his into his um, side of, of things at that time. I mean, events had changed. I mean, the mail was no longer the enemy. I mean, Mark Boland had brought a lot of us on board. And I can imagine he would have been like that. I mean, he, he was exasperated by Prince Edward on, on, on many occasions. In any event, Edward's media career was over, and Charles appeared as the protective, if indignant, father. I think it became apparent to Buckingham Palace that in promoting Charles, other members of the royal family were being denigrated. 
Most people who work for the institution of monarchy will say it is the institution that you work for, not the individuals within that, because that can be divisive. And I think that Mark Boland sacrificed the, the good of the whole for the good of the individuals. The Queen is marvellous in all kinds of ways, but she's quite ruthless when she needs to be, it seems to me. And she decided enough's enough, uh, had enough of this. In February 2002, one of the Queen's most trusted courtiers, Sir Michael Peat, was appointed to take control of Charles's court as his private secretary. Michael Peat's attitude was that the press office had been leaking like a calendar or the, the office around Charles had, and it was time to row back on that. And um, the private lives of the royals were to be kept absolutely private, and the press office was only there to uh, inform about the prince's charitable interests and his work. In effect, the relationship between the media and the monarchy was back on more traditional ground. But Boland did not go quietly. After resigning, he started to criticise his erstwhile employers through the medium he knew best, the press. In November 2003, the man the princes called Blackadder started writing a column of the same name for the news of the world. Over the following 18 months, he wrote a series of vitriolic articles about the royal family. Of Prince Charles, his former employer, he said he was flawed, petulant, self-pitying, a broken Humpty Dumpty. Of Prince Andrew, he said he was stupid, lazy, fat and arrogant. And Prince Harry, well, he was stupid too, but also gullible and with revolting friends. It's perhaps no surprise then that Mark Boland never did receive an honour for the work he did for the royal family. One's impression was that Mark Boland never really fitted in to the rest of the royal household. In retrospect, I have no doubt that the most senior officials at Buckingham Palace then and now regard that whole experiment as quite a serious mistake. Did he get down on one knee to propose? One forgets what he did. I mean, he turned coverage of Charles and Camilla from kind of zero to something that just about, you know, means that Charles has got a decent chance of perhaps becoming king in a way that people have some affection for him. All I will say is, regardless of whether or not sometimes we might agree or disagree on what he did, he got the result that he wanted. <laughs> But as Prince Charles married Camilla, heralding a new era for the heir to the throne, so the two young princes were about to move to centre stage. Phone hacking and the Leveson inquiry would see the press tamed. But in a world dominated by the internet, social media and the smartphone, the rules of the game would change again. And for the first family facing up to succession, much will turn on how they choose to manage their relations with the media. They sit at the very pinnacle of British society, the first family. But with no political power, how we see them and what we think about them is critical to the whole institution they represent. The royal family relies upon publicity and uh, popularity as its oxygen for survival. I think they've got unbelievable privilege and that comes at a cost. And the cost is, of course, they're always in this electronic goldfish bowl. Nothing can prepare you for what it's like to work for the royal family. They are the policy, they are the brand, they are flesh and blood. If the media were not interested in the royal family, the monarchy would be in serious trouble. And yet there was a time when that relationship went spectacularly wrong. So much so that Prince Charles needed the help of a spin doctor to rebuild his battered image. Charles knew virtually nothing about media relations. And now the younger worlds, William, Harry and Kate are locked in their own power struggle with the press. There were some paparazzi there and they were shouting, slag, whore, bitch, look this way. They viewed the press as this unmanageable beast, trying to get into every aspect of their lives. Every single mobile phone has got a camera on it now. I don't believe there is any such thing as private life anymore. But for the heir to the throne, it's now not so much his private life as his personal views that are under the media microscope. This is a prince who has a voice, 
wants to continue to have a voice, maybe when he's king. But will Britain tolerate an outspoken monarch? I just don't know. As the Queen gets older, succession beckons and heirs stand in line. So public interest in the royal family will intensify, which means their relationship with the media, so often strained, really has never been more important. This is the story of a decades-long battle over personal privacy and public image between the first family and the fourth estate, the monarchy and the media. Prince Harry have had to grow up in the media spotlight. Their family life subjected to truly extraordinary levels of public scrutiny. Well, I remember William's first day at Weatherby School. Diana said, now listen, William, you know, when we get there, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the press, and you know, must behave yourself, because you want to get this for the rest of your life. And he's sort of just like that Just William character. He sort of put his head down and says, I don't like photographers. When William and Harry's parents' marriage broke down, it happened in the most public and bitterly personal way imaginable. Press attention could not have been more intense. And even when Princess Diana died in a Paris underpass, she was being pursued by paparazzi press photographers. William and Harry were very angry. They basically viewed the media as having hounded their mother to death. I don't mean they vaguely thought, they actually specifically thought that is what had happened. There was a huge degree of anger and hostility. Because of that awful thing that happened in 97, we had to deal with William and Harry in a completely different way maybe than royal children had been dealt with before. How do we allow these two young men to grow up in the way that they have, um, knowing that the slightest mistake, that all teenage boys isn't going to be featured on the front page of a newspaper. Do you think they might have been overprotected? Possibly. In, certainly in the first couple of years after their mother died. But I think that was a normal human reaction. The media beast had been tamed by a series of deals which covered the princes whilst they were at school. But now William was about to turn 18, he would potentially be exposed for the first time to the unrestricted attentions of the press. He was due to embark on a gap year trip, the details of which had been kept secret. Good morning, when are you planning to leave? Um, quite soon. Um, I, I can't really say, but it's, it's soon. The question was, would the press play ball? Lord Wakeham, who had brokered the original school deal, proposed a solution. I said to him, my guess is there are 10 newspaper editors who know you're going to get you know, the plan for you to go on a gap year. They don't know where you're going, and they are spending resources to try and find out. Somebody will find out. That newspaper editor has got an exclusive. It's a good bully for him. But I said, there's another nine newspaper editors who all spent money trying to get this story who will be pretty fed up with you. So what I suggest to you is to do a deal. And so another deal was done to cover Prince William's 10 weeks of volunteer work in a remote part of Chile. Accompanying a reluctant William for a short part of his trip would be just one journalist, one photographer and one TV cameraman. There was a very low level of expectation from both ITN and the palace. This is William's time out. Um, I don't think he was overly keen with the idea. We're expecting very little, so anything that gets a bonus. Basically, it's the same every day. It's porridge and muesli. Ah. Marigolds are now officially a fashion item. <laughs> oh, he was obviously enjoying himself there. He was enjoying being able to do what he wanted to do, interact with people in a very normal way. Hello, you group jets out there. This is uh, Total Love. There's no press officers. There's no press office contact whatsoever. It was just us. I think he felt at ease, and that's what I suggested to him. I said, look, rather than somebody else who's not here talking about what you're doing here, why don't you say it for yourself? 
And that is how Prince William, the future king, came to do his first ever sit-down TV interview, unscheduled and unplanned. I'd set the camera up remotely behind me and as nervous as I am now talking to you, he must have been in front of my camera. I love being, having no restrictions, you know. There's no one out here chasing me around or anything, it's brilliant. You don't have any secrets here. Yeah. And that's why I find it very difficult myself to start with, because I'm a very private person, and I still am a private person. It's, it's very difficult to get away for your own time. So that's one thing I had to learn to deal with. I think Chile was a completely unique experiment. To send a cameraman, virtually unescorted, down to a remote part of the world with the future king, and all that could possibly go wrong with that, especially a young man who's not up to speed with what he's supposed to say or not supposed to say, what he's supposed to do or not supposed to do. And if that had gone wrong, that would have taken an awful long time to fix. As a first significant step into the media spotlight, William's gap year was pretty successful. The ice had been broken, he hadn't put his foot in it, and the rest of the media had, by and large, played ball. William then went off to university, where he was protected by another agreement with the press to leave him alone in exchange for the occasional photo opportunity. So he, more or less, disappeared from view, which is more than can be said for his younger brother, Prince Harry. Well, I knew him as a young boy. He was a bit of a rascal then, but a likeable rascal. School was a success for William, but not for Harry. He didn't really fit in very well at Eton. I'm not sure he was very happy there. You know, I think he was in a pretty bad place at the time. Harry had already got himself a bit of a reputation for misbehaving. And it was that narrative that stuck. In no time at all, the party prince was born. Over 18, out on the town, and unprotected by any deal with the press. Yes, he would get absolutely slaughtered in a, in a nightclub, rock out into the street at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. Paparazzi would be there, cameras in his face. But, you know, what would happen is the newspapers would have those shots from that one episode and they would use them in, the, in the, that week's papers, but then they'd hang on to them and they'd, they'd chuck them into the paper a couple of weeks later. Three weeks after that. So his behaviour is being exaggerated by the way the press Precisely. Was. They'd already written the narrative about Harry. He was the wild child, he was, he was off the rails, the complete antithesis of, of his goody-two-shoes brother. At the end of the day, he was only a teenager, had lost his mum at a very early age, was rebelling. You know, he wasn't the only one. Prince William was getting drunk quite a lot himself. Nobody seemed to report about that. So there was an image of the good prince and the bad prince, and, and Harry got labelled the bad prince. If the problem was Harry, as one senior courtier said to me, the solution was the army. But that wouldn't happen until he was 20, which meant the Royal Press Office faced nearly two years of Prince Harry as fair game for a hungry press pack. And the man who would have to deal with that was Prince Charles's new Director of Communications at Clarence House, Paddy Harveson, ex of the Financial Times and recently arrived from Manchester United. He had an absolutely straight-as-a-die attitude to public relations. He had no favourites. He made it very clear from the beginning that he was putting up with nothing. If the newspapers got it wrong, he would let them know. And it wasn't long before Harveson's no-nonsense approach would be tested in the shape of a particularly hostile article about Prince Harry in the Daily Express, penned by the columnist and self-confessed Wednesday witch, Carol Sala. Do you think you were, with hindsight, in any sense unfair to him? I mean, it's pretty trenchant. Prince Harry is a national disgrace. The drinking, the drugging, the yobbing, the explicit disdain for the lower orders. He has never once done anything because it was right and has rarely lifted a finger unless it's to feel up a cheap tart in a nightclub or shoot some harmless critter. <laughs> Did you know that it still is quoted back at me? <laughs> that, 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 is, that is pretty harsh. I think you describe it as a verbal bottom smacking. Yes. 
I knew the public would agree with this, but I did nevertheless expect next day's fish and chip wrapping. And that is what would have happened had not the palace seen fit to offer me the gift of a journalistic lifetime by fighting back. In an effort to put the record straight and to show some public support for his new client, Harvison wrote a letter condemning Sala's article as grossly unfair, ill-informed nonsense that showed no understanding of Prince Harry as a person. He also insisted that the Express publish it, which sent the story global. Harvison really should have shut up all around the world, and there were more than 200 countries. The headlines were along the lines of, the palace has protested about this vile journalist. It wasn't this vile journalist. Da, 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 da. I doubt very, very much that I'd have made it as far as Sydney or Los Angeles without Paddy Harvison's help. In fact, when Sala's article was published, Prince Harry and Paddy Harvison were already abroad on a trip that would work out much better for both of them. Harry was spending eight weeks of his gap year in the poverty-stricken African state of Lesotho. After all the unfavorable headlines about him in recent times, stories about yobbish behavior and visits to nightclubs, the prince now has a chance to show a more positive, a more serious side to his character. And one film crew from ITN stayed on to make a documentary about Harry's trip. Right. <laughs> First couple of days, we had all these amazing shots. It was really lovely stuff. You know, you only have to work in telly for 10 seconds to think, oh, my God, this is telly gold. She couldn't even cry, could she? Mm, no. She couldn't cry. She couldn't. She could barely be fed either. Yes, definitely. You know, he had this reputation as this sort of hard-living guy already, but here was a guy who seemed to me a bit vulnerable. The connection with the children and about whom he clearly did care a lot was in some way, you know, disadvantaged kids, his own personal kind of unhappiness did seem to be connected. What's all? Me. I think the suitor was a bit of a watershed moment. <laughs> the way he was with that child was very reminiscent of the Princess of Wales. It made me realise that, you know, this guy's got something special. But there was concern back at the Royal Press Office. I said, listen, you know, we will definitely have to do an interview, you know, so let's do it. The palace was really nervous about him talking about Diana. You know, would Charles be upset? Would it be difficult? Would it raise the old ghost? I think Harry had a lot he wanted to get off his chest. We literally switched on the camera and blur out it all came. I've always wanted to do this. It's okay, it's completely, it's, it is what she was doing. What I started off against Great Ormond Street and all this sort of stuff, it was very, you know, I'm only 19 and there's a half of me, there's a lot of me that wants to say, Right, it's now time to follow on or as much as I can, try and keep my mother's legacy going. I believe I got a lot of my mother in me, basically. And I, I just, I, just, I think she'd want us to do this, me and my brother. At the end of the day, Harry literally almost ran back to the car, almost, you know, and was absolutely a bullion in the car because he really felt like a man who'd got something he wanted to say off his chest. <laughs> Harry kept up his commitment to Lesotho, founding a children's charity in memory of his mother, called Centre Bali, which translates from the local language as forget-me-not. <laughs> William, meanwhile, remained largely hidden from view at university and protected from media intrusion whilst he was there. But not, it turned out, when he wasn't. The official annual photo call at Closters in March 2004 featured Prince William alongside his father. Harry was still in Lesotho. As usual, it was understood that after the photo call, the press would leave the royal party alone for the rest of their holiday. But it didn't take someone long to spot that William had company. A French paparazzi photographed William and Catherine on the, on the ski lift coming up together. The editor, Rebecca uh, Wade, as she was then, she had the pictures and she said, do you think they're an item? I said, yes, I do. And uh, she said, well, if we can prove that they're an item, we're running these pictures. By that end of that day, we stood it up that they were an item and she ran the pictures. 
By using paparazzi photos, the son had breached its agreement with the palace to leave the princes alone to enjoy their holiday. Paddy Harverson's response was swift and firm. Paddy Harverson decided that, you know, we were to be punished. And I remember the editor getting a letter saying, for the next uh, two photo calls, you will not be invited. And uh, the picture editor, sharp as a tack, said, get down to Buckingham Palace, do a picture outside. And uh, I think it was our Arthur's band or something. They were trying to play hardball and get serious about it, but because the editor didn't care. She's more interested in the story, and she was right. You know, this was a genuine story, because if someone's the girlfriend of, of a senior member of the royal family, they have every chance of being the wife, and you've got to cover that story. As second in line to the throne, William's private life had now become a matter of genuine public interest. But it wasn't so much personal privacy as media scrutiny of his political views and opinions that was threatening to cause trouble for Prince Charles, even raising questions about his role as future head of state. The Prince of Wales is said to regard himself as a political dissident who tries to influence opinion on some controversial issues. Those claims emerged on the opening day of a landmark case at the High Court. The case, heard in 2006, concerned a travel diary written by the prince in 1997 at the handover of Hong Kong, which had been leaked to the press. In it, Charles had referred to China's leaders as appalling old waxworks. The reaction of Paddy Harbison and the palace was to sue the Mail on Sunday to prevent further publication. The palace knew that in addition to this journal, we had um, seven others. And they began a legal action for breach of confidence and um, breach of copyright. They insisted that they were his private thoughts, that they went to a small number of friends, and that they were never intended for publication. They weren't intended to influence people. They were simply his private thoughts, um, and therefore confidential. And you said? We said our understanding is being given wide distribution, anything up to 50, 75 people at a time, and that the people he sent them to would include politicians, opinion formers. The prince has a long record of trying to influence politicians, and as such, the public have a right to know what he's doing and how he does it. The court found in favour of the prince, but the verdict was overshadowed by the evidence of Charles's own former spin doctor, Mark Boland, who had been called as a witness by the Mail on Sunday. In a sworn statement, he described just how far the prince was apparently prepared to go to promote his political views. Mr Boland argues that at the time, for example, of President Jiang Zemin's state visit to Britain in 1999, the Prince of Wales wanted his critical views about the Chinese leadership to be made public. In his witness statement, which the palace argued should not be made public, Mark Boland said, I was given a direct and personal instruction by the Prince to draw to the media's attention his boycotting of the banquet. This I did, as he knew, by briefing the press, as did a number of his friends. Charles declined to attend a state banquet for an incoming Chinese premier visit, and it was made pretty clear that he did it because he disapproved of what was going on in Tibet. It caused a huge diplomatic storm at the time. Charles believes that's, that's part of his, his raison d'etre. These are things he can do as Prince of Wales. He was born to a position that gave him influence but no purpose, in the sense that he has a, he has a platform and he has a name. D does he want influence? And yes, because that is exactly what he has been doing with his whole life. The Prince's excursions into matters of public policy inevitably attracted media attention, not all of it welcome. Meanwhile, for the new generation, the main preoccupation was not political opinions, but personal privacy. In summer 2005, William was due to graduate from university, which would mark the end of the press agreement to leave him alone. I really do want to be in control of my own life, and having spent 22 years being in the spotlight, you don't really know much different. Um, but I, I value more than anything 
the, the normality that I can get. It's all about trust with William. He has a very tight circle of friends, and if anyone breaks that circle of trust, they're outside the circle. And William wanted to extend it, not just um, to his friends, but to the people who work for him. Um, he had reason to believe that some of his father's staff, willingly or wittingly or unwittingly, had leaked information about him, um, which had appeared in, in the press, and he wanted to start, if you like, from a clean slate. The princes set up their own press operation, separate from their father. But stories about William and Harry just kept on appearing. And it was one such, a throwaway tidbit in a gossip column, that kicked off what would become the most serious scandal to affect the British press since the death of Diana. <laughs> it all started with that programme Tom Bradby made for ITV about Prince Harry's gap year trip to Lesotho. Harry's quite an enthusiastic home movie maker, and um, we'll leave it at that. Straight up through there. To help Bradby make his documentary, Prince Harry had lent him all the tapes he'd shot that year. Two k's away from. The One day I was sitting at home. I spent, you know, a couple of hours editing him a funny video set to music of his the, the unbroadcastable sections of his gap year. And when I next saw William, he said, oh, I love that video you did for Harry. And I said, well, it's, it's no skin off my nose, you know, I'll spend it if you want, I'll do one for you. And he said, yeah, that would be, do you know what, that would be really great. Any chance you have an hour on Monday night? I said, yeah, fine, could you please tell uh, Helen Asprey to leave your, my name on the gate? So this was like, from memory, it was sometime on a Saturday afternoon. So I didn't tell anyone about that, and there it was in the news of the world the next morning. Anyone reading the story might have presumed it was a leak from one of the prince's inner circle, but the two people directly involved knew differently. William said to me, I, I know totally it wasn't you, but that is a bit weird, isn't it? How the hell did that get out? And I said, well, listen, when I first became Royal Correspondent, I was told that, you know, reporters quite regularly listened into each other's voice messages. I would be amazed if they're not still doing it. So if you left messages, he said, well, yeah, I, funnily enough, I did. Well, I left a message with Helen. Alerted by William's suspicions, the police began an investigation and nine months later made their first arrests. It was the start of what became the phone hacking scandal. So when it became clear that they had been hacked and they were being hacked quite routinely, yeah. what was the reaction? I mean, my primary memory of that conversation with William was that it was like a light went on in his eyes, like, oh, yeah, oh, OK, oh, God, it all makes sense, you know. I think there was a very substantial degree of relief in that at last they could explain, you know. They'd mistrusted so many people in their circle over so many years. They'd had all these tests trying to catch people out, not their closest friends, but sort of people on the periphery, repeatedly trying to kind of work out who the hell was telling this stuff. And suddenly, well, there it all was. What were initially dismissed as the actions of one rogue reporter were eventually exposed as being widespread at the news of the world, and now we know going on elsewhere too. Phone hacking would in time prove to be a watershed for Britain's entire press establishment and one which would shift the balance of power decisively in the royals' favour. For the moment, though, it did look very much like business as usual. Kate Middleton made good copy for everybody, including people talking about people talking about Kate Middleton. Every day, Mobs of photographers were outside her house photographing her. Kate was coming through a gate at Heathrow, and the, there were some paparazzi there, and they were shouting, slag, whore, bitch, look this way. That's true. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Clarence House says it's greatly concerned by the hounding of Kate Middleton. They're hoping that the British press will impose a voluntary embargo on paparazzi photographs. She sort of existed in this slightly liminal world where she was a massive interest to people, but she didn't have any of the formal protections that the palace would give. The situation escalated on January the 9th, 2007, outside Kate's Chelsea flat. It was her 25th birthday, and speculation about a royal engagement was rife. I arrived here very early, 6 a.m., found a street littered with paparazzi photographers. Kate was a big story. 
There had been an agreement amongst the photographers and the broadcasters to stay this side of the street. Unfortunately, the pack broke. A young woman being pursued by photographers. The shadow of Diana looms very large. Come on. Diana was thrown to the dogs as Charles's girlfriend and fiance. She had to completely fend for herself. They weren't going to allow that situation to happen again. William's privacy lawyers were employed, and it was made perfectly clear that they would not tolerate Kate Middleton being harassed in the way she had been. William made a promise to Michael Middleton when he first started dating Kate I will protect her. And he has really been as good as his word. William now also had the European Court of Human Rights on his side. It had recently ruled that the right to privacy could still apply in a public place. And so the British press agreed not to buy any more paparazzi photos of Kate. The balance of power had shifted. Ten years on from her tragic death, there would be no rerun of the pursuit of Princess Diana. 2007 was a critical year for the royal family and Diana's legacy would loom large. Palace media managers were concerned that public reaction to the 10th anniversary of her death might rebound once again on Prince Charles. Their longer term strategy was to focus on TV, a more direct and generally controllable medium than the more troublesome press. First up, a Diana anniversary concert, designed to be owned by her two sons. No other senior members of the royal family were present. This evening is about all that our mother loved in life. Her music, her dance, her charities, and her family and friends. 2007 was also a big year for another British institution, the BBC. As well as the memorial concert, BBC Television was the chosen home for two major access documentary projects featuring the Queen and Prince Charles. This represented quite a turnaround in relations between the corporation and the palace, which was still recovering from an interview shown on BBC One fully 12 years earlier, back in 1995. I was Panorama's editor at the time. Do you think you'll ever be queen? No, I don't, no. Why do you think that? I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. Royal liaison is a post within the BBC. During the time uh, that I had been uh, in that role, relations uh, had always been uh, extremely good. Uh, the, the system was working well. But when something of the nature of that particular documentary came along, it was evident that this was a fracture. This was uh, a different area. This was revelatory in a sense that previous celebratory documentaries about the monarchy uh, had been. This was not. Most serious of all was Diana's verdict on the critical issue of Prince Charles and succession. Do you think he would wish to be king? There was always conflict on that subject with him when we discussed it. And I understood that conflict because it's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales, but it's equally a more demanding role, being king. And being Prince of Wales produces more freedom now, and being king would be a little bit more suffocating. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. The palace were very upset. I mean, what they felt, I think, particularly was we thought we had a, you know, you are the BBC. We didn't think you would do a thing like this. And then 
there was talk, well, we've been considering our relationship with the broadcasters, um, and the BBC used to produce the Queen's Christmas broadcast and distribute it around the world. They said, well, we think that uh, we, you know, our relationship with the BBC ought to be some more like that with other broadcasters, and we think it's time for, we take it in turns now, three years for the BBC and three years for ITN to make the Queen's Christmas broadcast. So I said, not entirely seriously, but I sort of meant it, ah, I see, so you, you don't get mad, you get even then. The Diana interview caused real strain in the relationship between the BBC and the palace. ITV went on to get not just the Christmas message, but the lion's share of royal access the BBC once took for granted. But by 2007, relations between the corporation and Buckingham Palace were back on an even keel. That is, until the 11th of July that year, when the BBC held a press preview for its forthcoming autumn season. The highlight was a trailer for a five-part documentary series then titled A Year with the Queen. Come on. In a journalist's life, there are a few stories that they will definitely remember what happened on the day. And, you know, like all great stories, it sort of started with, with not much. We'll do the rest. But things livened up when the trailer cut to an encounter between the Queen and American photographer Annie Leibovitz. Could we try it without the crown? Just... It will look better, le less dressy, because the, the garter robe is so extraordinary. Less dressy? What do you think this is? <laughs> what I mean is, if you, ta if you take the, the crown... At this point, the trailer cut to a shot of Her Majesty appearing to leave the room in a huff. So I'm not changing anything. I've done enough dressing like this. And I just think, wow, this is fantastic. Annie Leibovitz has upset the Queen so much that she's storming out of a photo shoot on camera and muttering how she's fed up of all this. So, so when you see it, do you think that's a story? I think bingo. You know, I've, I've been at the paper for just over a year and I'm constantly looking for a front page. And I'm thinking, well, today, I'm the one giving you that fantastic story. As we say in the journalism, ring the bell. It's eight o'clock on Thursday, the 12th of July. The headlines, the Queen has stormed out of a photo shoot after being asked to take off her crown. Can awesome. I just show you the picture yes. inside because you get to see the Queen's <laughs> face here. That is a picture, isn't it? By the following morning, the story led the BBC's news on radio and TV and spread around the world like wildfire. The Royal Tantrum was a headline story on the front page of The Sun and just about everywhere else. But it wasn't until lunchtime that the truth came out. Good afternoon. The BBC has had to apologise to the Queen for wrongly implying that she stormed out of a royal photo shoot. They've also apologised to the photographer, Annie Leibovitz. A trailer released yesterday for a BBC documentary series... Nearly 24 hours after the story broke, the BBC had to admit that the Queen hadn't stormed out at all. In fact, as the continuation of the footage clearly shows, she had been on her way in. I mean, when did the Queen walk out of anything in a half? And, you know, and if you, someone shows you a bit of film in which that appears to happen, don't you say, hang on, this can't be right. Which was precisely the reaction over at Buckingham Palace. Unofficially, I'm told, uh, the Palace raised this with uh, the BBC yesterday after journalists began making calls following the BBC press conference at which the trailer was shown. The danger was clear, you know, reputationally. You make stupid mistakes on something like that and everybody thinks you've lost your marbles and the standards have gone. Queengate, as it quickly became known, was a near disaster for the BBC and its relationship with the Palace, having caused such embarrassment to the Queen with the original trailer and then failing to correct the story for fully 24 hours, the corporation was forced into damage limitation mode. And working relationships with the palace were fairly quickly restored, but with the balance of power tipped once again in the royals' favour. All things considered, 2007 had turned into a rather good year for the royal family in their relationship with the media. The firm appeared to have the whip hand. <laughs> Meanwhile, Prince William, by now signed up to his traditional royal duty of a period of military service, was still managing to keep a remarkably low public profile. 
By going into the army, he was protected there by the, the solidarity of the military, if you like. When he was on a military base, no one could reach him. And he knew that, therefore, his movements and who he is seeing were pretty safe. And this continued for a long time. And in a way, I think it became sort of self-fulfilling because he was delaying doing royal engagements because of his, his military activity, and that kept the press at bay. But as second in line to the throne, William had little choice but to expose some aspects of his private life to public view, albeit at arm's length and by agreement with an overwhelmingly compliant media. All the more compliant as the press was about to find itself back in the dock, literally. The phone hacking scandal had finally gone critical and the government had set up a wide-ranging inquiry to look into the culture, practices and ethics of the press to be chaired by a senior judge, Lord Justice Leveson, which meant that the papers were very much on their best behaviour. But in the brave new world of the internet and the smartphone, no amount of protection from press intrusion will save you. If that is, you choose to invade your own privacy. August 2012, the party prince and friends had been enjoying a summer break in Las Vegas when they ran into a hen party. What started as hijinks in the swimming pool ended up as a game of strip billiards in Harry's hotel room, all captured on a handy camera phone. The pictures could be seen by anyone, anywhere in the world, at the click of a mouse. But the British press were wary. They'd all received letters from the Queen's solicitors, Harbottle and Lewis, reminding them of their obligation not to invade Harry's privacy. The pictures were sent in overnight from the States. First thought is, wow. The second thought is, can we? It became pretty clear in the first 24 hours that, that nobody in the UK was going to publish. Um, you've got to remember this was sort of almost immediately post Levison. Uh, there was a pretty febrile atmosphere. We were already in the world where we were uh, thinking twice or three times. Levison has probably caused us to think the fourth time as well before doing things. So what did you make of the arguments that Harbottle and Lewis made about Prince Harry's privacy? Well, he's gone to a hotel room, he's invited strangers up there. He has breached his own privacy pretty much by doing that. And that, would, that ultimately became our view. Our headline was, here it is, here's the pictures you've already seen on the internet. So that there was an element of, you know, this is ridiculous. The vast majority of people had already seen them. Is it right that uh, print products should therefore not print them? I don't think it is. Once again, Harry had made the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and a tour of duty with his regiment in Afghanistan provided welcome respite. I don't believe there is any such thing as private life anymore. I'm not going to sit here and whinge. Um, everyone knows about Twitter and the internet and stuff like that. Um, every single uh, mobile phone has got a camera on it now. You can't move an inch without someone judging you. It's an unstoppable force. And then in September 2012, just a few weeks after Harry's adventures in Vegas, the unstoppable force popped up again, this time from abroad, when a French magazine, Closer, printed long-lens paparazzi photos of a sunbathing Duchess of Cambridge, topless. The result, angry complaints from Kensington Palace and an injunction preventing further publication. But the old rules no longer apply. Once again, the pictures are out there on the internet. On the face of it, the Kate Topless photos were a classic piece of paparazzi intrusion. And indeed, the perpetrators are still awaiting trial in France. Trouble is, the new media genie is well and truly out of the bottle. Back in the world of controlled public events and traditional media, William, Kate and baby George are on their first major public engagement, last year's official visit to Australia and New Zealand. At first sight, it looks like William's people have got things pretty buttoned up. A series of carefully orchestrated and minutely controlled events are going very much to plan. OK, everyone just getting know. So there's a set of stairs, he's here. But on the ground, relations with some of the media 
are showing distinct signs of strain. On the corso, which is elevated, so you either choose to go on the corso or on the sand. So you need to choose up or down and then stay. And for hard-pressed UK reporters, it is proving difficult to make a news story out of what is essentially an extended photo opportunity. These are the first people I've ever covered, ever, who will not speak to me at all. And more than that, the people who represent them will brief me about their movements, about where I can go and where I stand, but they won't tell me anything about what these people think. Now that's weird. We play by their rules. Should we do that? I don't know. I'm uncomfortable about it. I'm, I'll be very honest about that. And although the Australian public have clearly taken to the royal couple, some in the local media are not so comfortable either. So we're going to get George on Yeah, there. I know. That's the main attraction. <laughs> the affection that William enjoys in Australia is because the Australian public genuinely believe that that affection is mutual. But journalists don't feel that way and don't feel that he feels that way about them. I think Australian journalists by and large, probably had the same experiences as journalists overseas, and he's very standoffish. They're not going to sit down and grant interviews. Their interviews are few and far between. I think a lot of journalists are actually charmed by William, but I think there is an acknowledgement that, that he's not quite the warm and fuzzy character that maybe some of the people lining up in the streets think he is. For all of his easygoing facade, uh, Prince William is obviously a very controlling character. I think there's concern in the wider royal household about William's insularity, if you like, and the way he's excluding the media in many ways. He doesn't want to interact with the press and broadcasters in the way that his father has done over the years. I think there is a concern that if this were to increase and to continue, uh, o over the years to come, and it could be a problem for the royal family because you know it, it, we need to know. We, we you know we feed off them, and, and they feed off our affection for them, and it, it's a two-way street. William's innate hostility to the press, which now um, people would sympathise with, that could rebound at a later date. You occasionally see photos of him where there's a kind of rictus of dislike on his face. You, you know that the dislike is created by the photographers and the press surrounding him, but the problem is for him that can just end up looking like somebody sort of haughty and entitled. And I think if he doesn't play along a little bit more, he may actually find a, there's a backlash that grows against him. But of course, William is currently second in line to the throne. His father is the heir, and as the Queen scales back her public duties, Prince Charles is taking on more. Each one of us is here because of the hope and the trust we place in the Commonwealth. However, the troublesome question of Charles's political activism in support of his favoured causes and interests has not gone away. Back in April 2005, the Guardian newspaper took advantage of the Freedom of Information Act to find out about Prince Charles's correspondence with government ministers over the previous seven months. The government vetoed the request, but was required to disclose how many notes there had been and to whom. The response to The Guardian made clear that he'd written 27 letters, or at least 27 letters had been passed between him and government ministers uh, to seven government departments. They included the Culture Department, the Northern Ireland Department, the Business Department, the Environment Department, uh, the Health Department and the Cabinet Office. So there's a whole range there across Whitehall. And what we also know is that these letters contain deeply held views um, of the Prince of Wales and that they were um, they were personal views and strong views and that they were particularly frank in what they said to government ministers. Attorney General at the time Dominic Grieve couldn't have been plainer. In his statement on behalf of the government opposing the release of the Prince's memos he said and I quote it is highly important that he that is the Prince of Wales is not considered by the public to favour one political party or another. Any such perception would be seriously damaging to his role as future monarch 
because if he forfeits his position of political neutrality as heir to the throne, he cannot easily recover it when he is king. Having lost at the Court of Appeal, the government took the issue of the so-called spider memos to the Supreme Court, and judgment is due imminently. Meanwhile, as questions of succession come to dominate royal media relations, there are signs that the household and its press operations are increasingly divided about how to handle Prince Charles's public profile. At the beginning of last year, there was a great plan backed by Charles to amalgamate all the press offices under one roof. And within a, a few short weeks, the whole thing had fallen apart. He felt that there was an attempt to sort of confine what he was doing, perhaps to tone down some of his speeches, cut down on some of his charity work, which was something he wasn't prepared to do. So he withdrew his cooperation. You mean with an eye on succession? the household in general were trying to sort of prepare things for an easier transition. Yeah, that's exactly it. Sometime in the not too distant future, Charles will be crowned king. Are we going to have a monarch like his mother who has been scrupulous in keeping her views private for 60 years? We know nothing about the Queen's views, about virtually anything. Or are we going to have a monarch, King Charles, who wants the public to know what he thinks about the issues of the day. We don't really know yet, but the idea that he's suddenly going to shut up shop, I mean, forget about it. I think he, he'll want to continue to have a dialogue. The potential consequences for Prince Charles when he eventually does ascend to the throne are already being played out. It is, after all, Prince William, not his father, who will visit China this year as the Queen's representative. What Prince Charles faces as succession approaches, though, is a new media battle, not of the old tabloid paparazzi type, but over public scrutiny of his personal views and public acceptance of what will surely be a very different style of monarchy. <laughs>